Maria Hornbacher is the best-selling author of numerous books, including Wasted, A Memoir of Anorexia and Bulimia, and Madness, A Bipolar Life. This is Maria Hornbacher. I'm Duncan Gammy. You're listening to Dunk Tank. All right. Uh, I'm here with Maria Hornbacher. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you've written a number of books. I first got introduced to your work through your memoirs, and I was particularly fascinated with the first book that you wrote, and you were pretty young when you wrote it, um, Wasted. Yeah. Embarrassingly yeah. young, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, like really young to be talking about, I mean, very uh, uh, you know, deep subject matter too. So like what, at what point did you decide what what compelled you to to put that out there? You know, that's a great that's a great question. And I, I answer it a little bit differently now than I would have probably, you know, ten years after it came out or, you know, five years even. Um, when that book came out, <clears throat> you know, just to look at the literary context, the the memoir boom had not happened yet. And so what we now know as like the memoir was still a very, very controversial genre, even. Certainly memoirs by women uh, were particularly uh, looked at, particularly askance, and memoirs by 22-year-old women were just like, oh, please, right? (laughs) Uh, And so I was like, that's fair, that's fair. But at the same time, one of the things that women my age and a little bit older, the women who were writing memoirs at that time were saying was essentially, look, the, you know, it's going back to an old feminist line of the personal is political. We were talking about the fact that our lives actually did have sociocultural influences within them and also spoke to social cultural influences that were part of our lives. Um, now, when we talk about personal lives, we're, we kind of take it as given that our social lives and our, our personal lives intersect. At the time, that was like the death of literature. And I was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to be a part of that, but here you are. <laughs> so to, to specifically answer what inspired me to write it, I did not actually realize I was going to write a memoir because we didn't really have language for that at the time, right? right. So my intention and the book I was setting out to write was an academic uh, work, a feminist critique of pop culture as it gave rise to the incredible misogyny that underlies eating disorders and body hatred. So that's where I was going with it. And obviously that's not where it went, where it went ultimately, uh, but that was the original idea. Gradually, it became um, clear to me that more people wanted to know my own experience with eating disorders than, than, than even I did, than, than I did. You know, I was a lot less interested in my experience than, uh, than in the, the cultural context of it. But you know, at that time, that story wasn't out there um, and people needed to know that they weren't alone in that. So that's where that, a long answer to your question. That's where it came from. No, no. Um, well, you, you spoke about the misogyny there. And it, it's yeah. interesting because I, I, I've known a, a number of women who have had eating disorders. I know one guy who's yeah. had an eating disorder. Well, yeah. Why? And you talk about in your book, you developing bulimia at nine years old. And that, mm-hmm. I mean, that to me, that feels like shocking. But I'm, I'm certainly, you're not the only one. What I'm do not. you think? Right. I mean, what do you think is. Why, why is that such a big issue, particularly with young girls? You know, it's the thing is, it's not okay. So this is one of those touchy questions where, like, it's by no means just girls. It's right. By no yeah, means of course. Just young people, right? But the fact is that the the hysteria around, and I say that with something of a tongue in cheek business here. You know, sure. none of us has a wandering womb and all that. But the reality is, there are more eating disorders among female and cis female people who who are born into families where gender is a thing whether that is um they are pressured to succeed in spite of being girls or pressured to be a type of girl or any number of things you know gender is so incredibly constructed in this culture anyway that uh I think to me, really over time, I've, I've started to see it as sort of the performance of femininity and the performance of masculinity is as much a precursor to eating disorders as it is a charade. You know, so I mean, these are, there, there's a lot going on there, but I think that the fact is that part of, the, part of this is that girls at a young age do start to feed into each other's fears about being girls. There's, there's a competitiveness that is fostered within, um, within our lives in the same way that Lord of the Flies, you know, saw, saw little boys kind of killing each other, you know. Right. So it's not just girls, but one of the acceptable ways to be feminine, and I say that very much in quotes, one of the acceptable ways to be feminine is to hate your body. 
It's like a given. Like, so you listen to mm. women who haven't seen each other in a while. What's the first thing they say? Oh, wow, you look great. You've lost weight. Weird, weird. That's like not a topic to me. Like if I bump into my friends and I'm like, hey, you've lost weight. They're like, why are you talking to me about what I weigh? It's like, right. it's, not a th- it's not a thing. But very much in the, in the kind of common parlance of gendered conversation, women really do get encouraged to fixate on and compete amongst each other and with each other for who can be the right size, the right shape. And all of that boils down to a super essentialist argument of like, what is the right woman? What is a good woman? Now, among the men and the young men and uh, the people who are not binary, who deal with eating disorders, they are largely overlooked because people are so acclimated to thinking this is a little girl's thing. People of color also overlooked by the fact that people think, oh, only white little girls get this issue. Neither of those things is true. The fact is that within communities that are not white little girls communities, those issues are not dealt with as visibly or as, um, or they're not given as much time. And I think people don't know how to talk about them yet. Yeah. It's, I mean, the, the guy that I knew who had an eating disorder, very secretive about it and very sure. much like, oh my God, because of that association of like, okay, this is like a, a little girl's illness. This is not right. something that a man should be dealing with. Right, right. Uh, but the yeah, yeah and again, that, that becomes the structure of uh, you know, if if a if a man is dealing with uh, or someone who identifies as male is dealing with an issue he or others perceives as too feminine, too female. What's the you know what's the what's the thesaurus corollary there? Too weak, too you know, frivolous, too ditzy, too whatever. Um, you know, I mean, I'm still 20 years after that book came out, listening to people say, "What you know? Why did you even write about eating disorders?" I'm like, "Well, you know, public health crisis, things like that." But otherwise, it's a pretty non non important sure. issue. <laughs> but the thing is, we're so used to thinking that if it's a woman's issue, it's not a real issue after all, and that's garbage. That's when you talk about, oh, like the idea, the ideal body type or what a woman should look like. Um, you yeah. were at one point, you were like 52 pounds. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that, yeah, that is, so, yeah, go ahead. The thing about the, the idea of the, the weights for one thing can be real triggering to people using the specific numbers. Okay. And triggering, again, was not a word we used at that time. And so had I, uh, if I could go back and write the book over, I wouldn't even use the weights. That okay. said, the idea of eating disorders as an attempt to become perfect is one of our great misperceptions of eating disorders. The idea of an eating disorder, the idea of especially strict anorexia is not to become perfect or attractive, it's to kill yourself. You know, mm-hmm. let's, let's be clear, this is slow suicide and not even that slow. Um, and so, but at the same time, you know, we don't see people putting heroin addicts on billboards and being like, wow, look at their self-control as they nod out. You know, that's not going to happen, you know, but we do really do that with eating disorders. It's like this super complicated site where our beliefs about how people should behave, especially girls or uh, women should behave. We are actively suppressing our own appetites, like voluntarily. So whatever I weighed kind of makes no difference. The point is that the more grotesque I got, the more I felt like I was succeeding at being very good at killing myself. And there's not a whole lot of other areas in our life in the world, especially in mental health, where we can say, oh, she's doing a really good job, you know, self-destructing, that's awesome. But that's what our models do, you know? And so we really do glamorize and celebrate that, the outcomes of that disorder. At the time, were you thinking to yourself that this was suicidal? At a point, yeah. Not, Not like I want to die, but at a certain point, I did recognize that all my best arguments for why I was doing it were garbage. You know, I mean, my best arguments were like, well, you know, I mean, no matter how dysmorphic your sense of your body is, no matter how incorrect you are when you look in the mirror, I was aware that, no, you know, eventually, Maria, you'll just die of this, and that's ridiculous. So do you want to do that? And ultimately, that's why I was able to kind of come back from it, is the recognition that you can't halfway recover. You know, I mean, a lot of people do, they kind of dabble in recovery and they dabble in illness and they never fully make a decision to live again. But for me, it was really never, uh, I have a very hard time lying to myself. I don't, I don't like lying to other people either, but it's particularly hard for me to lie to myself. And so when I would say to myself, oh no, this is just a little problem I have. Well, at a certain point you're on life support for the ninth time. And you're like, this isn't just a little problem I have anymore. This is something else. 
And so you have to face up. And at what point, so you, you made that decision to, I mean, I, I imagine there had to have been like some attempts before that final moment of saying like, I've got to somehow seek help or stop this where yeah. like fits and starts, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and like, I mean, you know, clearly you, you, you know enough about addiction processes to know that there are fits and starts and that the process is not just one direct shot to the bottom and then one bouncing back. It's not, it's not like that. It's like, like every other sort of progress, we do a lot more spiraling than we do straight lines. Um, and that's true of mental health recovery of any kind. You know, that's, that's really the fact of it. And, and for that matter, physical health, you know, when we heal, we don't just go, I was very sick. And then every day I got a little bit better in the same amount. That's not how bodies work either. Right. Um, so it's not how life is. So, so yes, I'd been, I'd been hospitalized. I'd been in treatment. I'd been, you know, given talkings to, I had tried, I had not tried, I had, you know, I'd done all the things. And at some point I really was just like, I am so sick of myself. You know, like yeah. the obsession is so all, like obsession is by definition, it's all consuming. Right. So like I got tired of my only thought process. I'm a reasonably, you know, quick study. And I got tired of my thoughts. Like when I was like, oh, I can't really pay attention to the Dostoevsky reading today because I have to go count calories in a stick of gum. You know, I mean, that's just, yeah. you know, at a certain point, like, and people get very, very mad at me when I'm straight up about this because they're like, you're minimizing the reality of my pain. I'm like, no, your pain, if you would deal with your pain, we could talk. But what you're doing is deflecting that pain onto something that really is frivolous. That really, yeah. really is, you know, and that's, that's our behaving culturally as we're supposed to behave, you know, fritter away time, deal with things that aren't meaningless, that aren't meaningful, and you won't actually be very effective or very threatening to anything else. When you wrote the book, did you feel to yourself like, okay, I'm, I'm recovered enough to be able to give this some distance and write about it in a, like a reasonable way? Or how, how did that Yes, yeah, that's mind. a good question. I think, you know, when I went into the book, my goal, as I said, was to write more of an academic critique, a, you know, social critique of uh, eating disorders in pop culture. That said, uh, I kind of went back and forth. Was I removed from it insofar as like, how would I write about eating disorders now from a vantage point of 20 years of recovery? I wouldn't. They don't interest me enough. You know? Yeah. you know, I wouldn't write about it 20 years from now. And I think part of what is uh, worthwhile about that particular having written that book as young as I did, gave readers who are in the thick of it or families who have a partner or a wife or a mom or a daughter or a colleague or a sister, or whatever, uh, it gave people a, the vantage point of someone who is within the struggle, right? <clears throat> I had enough distance from it to detach, to say, I have to let this go, I'm walking away. But when I wrote that book, I was really only a few years into recovery and I didn't really have a sense at that time of how much better recovery got mm. because we don't know very much about eating disorder recovery because very few people model it. There aren't a lot of stories about like, where I was, when you look at like the 12 step programs, people in recovery from alcoholism, addictions, all that stuff, they'll say, you know, I've been in this, I've been in this game of recovery for 30 years and these are the things that get better. With eating disorders, you are really given to believe that you're never fully going to recover. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people say it the same way every time they say, it. now I know I'll always deal with this. And my answer always is like, well, if you decide you're going to always deal with it, yeah, you'll always deal with it. On the other hand, if you decide you're not going to deal with it anymore, you might not. Um, so I did not have the distance that I would, you know, you know, the book is very clearly written by a 22 year old who's, no. who's got all the 22 year old things happening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm full of upheaval. I'm full of, uh, anger and excitement and, and passions of, of thought and, uh, emotional stuff at 22, your brain's not even done developing, right? You know that. Yeah. We all know that, right? Well, I hope we all know that. But <laughs> that said, that said, you have insights at that time that you, I think, lose track of later on. It's like listening to little kids. They sometimes say things way wiser than what we know as grown ups. They're like, oh, why is this happening? And there's this blinking moment where you're like, I have no idea. I've just been taking it for granted for so long that I stopped questioning it. That also is true with the eating disorders. And so when I wrote that book, I was willing to say things that I think a lot of people who are my age now, 46, wouldn't say, you know, because mm. nobody was willing to cough up just how ugly that business is uh, of eating disorders. And I was willing to say that. And, you know, I took a, I took a lot of hits for it, but it, 
you know, it stands as what it is. It's not the writing of a, of a mature adult. It's the writing of someone who's in, in the thick of it. What, what were some of the hits that you took from it? Oy, uh, well, you know, that's, uh, when the book came out, I think, you know, hindsight is great, but people, every, every writer who lives long enough and writes long enough uh, recognizes that their stuff changes not because the book changes, but because culture changes. So when, when Wasted came out, it's 1998, <clears throat> it was, uh, to women and men who were reading it at that time, it was the first time anyone had been honest in a public forum about what that business was like. 10 years later, the idea of a trigger became very, very popular and became huge, especially in academic and pop culture circles, as people began to say, well, talking about these illnesses triggers fragile girls. And it makes people sad and it hurts people's feelings and it re-traumatizes people and all these things. But they didn't actually have any data at that time on what is the role of talking about a subject. I mean, to me, it became like this conversation of, well, if you don't teach kids about sex, they won't have it. Right. And that's <laughs> insane, of course. But, but also, it was insane to me to say, you know, well, you know, probably the problem is we started talking about eating disorders and people got ideas. And I'm like, hmm, mm, mm, okay. Logically, that's not how things happen. Eating disorders boomed because they were popularized in the pop culture like they were rewarded over and over and over one book about the gruesome nature and the disgustingness of eating disorders probably didn't tip us over the edge but okay yeah. so for about 20 years uh wasted was like you know the devil incarnate in eating disorder fields and that's why i stopped uh that's why i stopped publicly speaking about eating disorders because people wanted so badly to blame old school eating disorder theory on, uh, they wanted to blame their kids' problems on the fact that anybody had mentioned it. You know, their kids yeah. never would have gotten sick if we hadn't said something. Well, eh, not so much. Yeah, I think that that seems like, okay, I, I can understand on one level, like there is probably, uh, there in theory, there could be an unhelpful way to talk about eating disorders. Oh, I mean, yes. they're, they're, no question, for sure. Yep. Um, but your book is definitely not that. I mean, yeah, you're not yeah, glamorizing I mean, it. You're not, you're not making it seem attractive in any way. I mean, obviously, I'm looking back with hindsight, you probably have things that you would change, as you said. But, yeah, yeah. you know, that, uh, that, that must have been a weird feeling for people as you, you got older to start pointing the finger at you. At, at yeah, saying, it you was know? fascinating. I was, you know, women of my generation, we're second generation feminists, right? So that's an old school thing. We're like, we got very used to in the 90s talking about what we thought pretty openly and taking a hit for it. So I wasn't unprepared. What I was shocked by was that women and women who call themselves feminists were going after me for having basically, it, the, the argument was that I had glamorized my own eating disorder and other people were following suit. So there's a couple things there. There's, you know, the element that needs to be attended to there is the fact that when people are ill and self-destructive, they will seek out things that make them iller and more self-destructive. Now that can be the tag in the back of their pants. It can be a magazine advertisement. It can be any number of things, but at the same time, you know, if there's a pedophile out there, he may have a copy of Lolita. Does that make sure. Lolita not a book? Right. You know, does it make, you know, Catcher in the Rye, lots and lots of sociopaths have Catcher in the Rye in their bookshelves. Well, that's because they teach it in high schools in America. You know, so it's just like <laughs> chicken or the egg. You know, what do we seek out? What do we feed ourselves intellectually that creates situations in our lives? And where do we seek out things that worsen our illness? Like I don't hang out in bars because I don't drink, right. you know, like they say, they say, you know, sooner or later you hang around a barbershop long enough, you'll get a haircut, right? So if someone is young, actively eating disordered or actively eating disordered and struggling with symptoms, am I going to recommend wasted hell no? You know, I mean, I don't want you reading that right then. That book is meant for people who don't genuinely don't get it yeah. to understand it. It is not, it is not a how to, it is not a recovery manual either though. So being aware of what you've got there. It's, you know, like everything else, we get, we get really simplistic when we talk about, well, this book caused this or this conversation caused that. It's, it's, so, it's so much more nuanced than that, you know. 
Yeah, and it also seems to be, I mean, there there are all these like free speech wars going on, but it seems on yeah. some level to be, you know, to, to blame a good faith effort to explore an illness and say, oh, this is actually self-destructive and, you know, we should do away with this. It seems <laughs> uh, counter to principles of free expression on some level. It uh, does. And, you know, coming from a, a journalist background, I was really going... Oh, well, you know, definitely. It was sort of like the mother blaming movements that have existed forever of just like, you know, it's, it's just, it's a don't shoot the messenger kind of thing. Mm. And, uh, you know, I've, I stopped giving talks on eating disorders when I was giving a, I was giving a lecture at a, at a conference for clinicians who deal with eating disorders. And this woman raised her hand and said, are you actually saying that you think people can recover from eating disorders because they decide to? And I said, yes. I am saying that. And she just like, I mean, she was like, steam was coming out of her ears. And she goes, so you're saying that you think eating disorders are the sufferer's fault? I said, absolutely <laughs> not. That's not what I said. I mean, like, let's keep our logic right. intact. Logic 101, kids. Um, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like, you fall into the ditch, it's still your job to get out of the ditch. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, that those two things can coexist, that it's not your right. fault, but also you, you can... I mean, on some level, we're not like robots. We have some ability to make choices. Um, we have a lot of ability to make choices. I think a lot more than we realize. Um, one of the things you, you mentioned there, like not drinking. And mm. that when, you, when you first uh, published this book, it, as you said, it was one of the, the books that sort of like sparked this memoir boom. And it sold something over like a million copies. And you're in your early 20s. Like, what the hell is that like to get all that <laughs> attention, you know? Well, you know, this is like a key piece of that is recognize the internet didn't really, wasn't what it is now. We had oh, AOL, yeah. right? We had email. And for those of us in, in journalism, we had Alta Vista, we had the search engines. There was no Google yet, right? So like what we know now to be getting attention is a very different thing than you know, I mean, like to know that I was getting attention, I would have had to be reading all the magazines and reading all the papers and following all the lists and all this shit. But I didn't do that. You know, yeah. I went on with my life and wrote another book, went back to college, finished my degree and then started teaching and kind of went on with my life. Um, I did not really become aware of the kind of gossip slash rumor slash sort of discourse world until everybody else did, you know, the, you know, with the rise of with the rise of social media. And so getting that attention was largely abstract to me. You know, I mean, yeah, I was aware that, that, you know, things, my books were being reviewed and I was aware that it was causing fuss and bother. And I, you know, did the interviews and I did the things, but it was a really different animal. We, I didn't even have a cell phone when that book came out. Wow. Like my yeah. phone was attached to the wall. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you feel lucky in some ways not to have been, uh, not to have had that happen in like this media environment? Yes. I, on the other hand, though, Duncan, I wouldn't have written it if we had this world. Why is that? Because it's too like, um, you know, I will say maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just sounding like almost boomery, but um, <laughs> the quality of conversation that used to take place around books and ideas has declined. Not because all of it has declined, but because there's a lot more garbage available. Um, and mm. so all that garbage, like the stupid conversations are all caught up in with the decent conversations. And so we have way too much, um, we have way too much demanding our attention. And I think that book, given that it, 10 years after it was already, I was like on book three by the time this, this upheaval around it came up. Um, the fact that 10 years later, everybody decides to like dredge up this old book and go, this is the problem. I was like, whoa this is intriguing and so yeah. I stayed out of social media for a long long time uh, because that was when that hit was you know everybody decided pro anasites were all the thing and I, I was just like wow guys you know it's not like internet invented crazy yeah crazy predates this by a long span <laughs> so I'm glad yeah I'm glad it didn't come out then but had I had I had any sense of how fast life and and uh, discourse would get, I wouldn't have written it at this time. Well, so you say that's because the, 
like the discourse around books has has weakened it, around ideas really okay. you know around ideas and so like i went on i went on facebook did i go on facebook every now and then and i have a, i have an account and every now and then i check out and i'm like enough of the garbage but um like i went on today and was like okay i'm watching this herd of people copy and paste the same stupid rant without fact checking it. Like I saw it all over Facebook this morning. I'm like, guys, just, you know, could we stop with the misinformation? That is what passes as having an opinion now. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not the only person saying that I feel like things have gotten a bit watered down, Mm. but that said, the same thing can happen with a book that is volatile. I mean, there is no sociocultural artifact that's not volatile, right? Like we don't, we don't, we are not living in a vacuum, any of us now or then, but especially not now. Now we're in this gigantic nonstop information onslaught that I don't think, you know, given how out of control the conversation around that book got 10 years after its publication, I cannot fathom how out of control the conversation would have been today. Yeah. I mean, the, the only, the only counterpoint to that is you do have podcasts now, which sure, are, do. Are, are, are very nice to have long form yeah. discussions. I mean, yes. some of the most popular podcasts in the world right now regularly run to like three hours and they talk to people who have written books. Yes. So it, it's not, it's not impossible. I just think you have a huge flood, as you said, of information in the form of things like Twitter or Facebook, yes. which are designed to be bite-sized and therefore yes. limited yes. in terms of their <laughs> thinking. You know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I find podcasts to be the, the shining, the light kind of at the end of the tunnel in what has been a really bad era for media for about 10 years, you know? And so I find podcasts are really where I think those dialogues are beginning to get substantive again. And so, yeah, I think you're spot on. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 hopefully that's something that, you know, continues to expand and sort of outweighs the influence of, of the social media. But yeah. when, when, you, when you were that young, when you were like 22, 23, and mm-hmm. like, but on, even though you didn't have all this social media around, certainly you knew that this book was, was selling a lot of copies and like that, that has to, if I had written a book at 22 that sold over a million copies, it would, even if people were not constantly coming up to me and trying to debate the premise of my book, it would substantially change, I don't know if substantially, but it would change my, my life on some level. It would, it, would, it would feel like a certain achievement, and I don't know how exactly I would deal with that. You know, I, that's so funny. I think... There may be a gender element of this. My buddy, Michael Oatman, who's a playwright and a genius and a funny, I teach with him at, at Nebraska, right? I went up to him afterwards and he, after a reading, I was like, hey, what you been doing today? He goes, I've been writing. And I go, ah, are you in that stage where you're like, I hate everything I ever wrote? He goes, no, man, I'm a guy. I think it's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and so like that sense of the idea that I could have at that time thought, wow, I've made a, I've made a decent product here. I've, I've got an achievement. That is exactly the opposite of how it felt. How it felt was all of a sudden I've spent my whole life trying not to, not to like speak up too loud or like cause a fuss or get too much attention or take too much of this, that, or the other thing, you know? And all of a sudden that's exactly what I had done. I had walked right into the middle of the room and been like, Hey everyone, I have an unpopular opinion. Let's talk about that. (laughs) You know, so, so like that was the um, that was the feeling was I didn't feel like I had achieved something. I felt like I wanted to crawl under the table and go away forever. And in fact, my next book, my second book, didn't come out for seven years because I went into kind of I went into kind of a hidey spot. I went into I took off for a while. Wow. Yeah, and I but needed to. I really needed to get out of that kind of jet setty garbage thing that didn't feel real to me. It didn't feel real. What, what jet setty garbage thing? So like tour, right? <clears throat> Back in the day when we could go out of the house, um, I, uh, you know, tour took months and months and months. And so I'm like literally flying all over the world and going to these readings. And at the same time, it's like, I can get up in front of a room full of people and give a reading and play grown up. And then they take me back to my hotel and everybody's like, nice job, great job. And I get up at four o'clock the next morning and go fly somewhere else. But at the same time, I'm a kid. I'm a yeah. kid. You know, I was like, 
it was there was a lot going on in my own life at that time. I mean, my, my best friend had just died and my family was collapsing. And so all the realities of life, which never pause, those were all kind of hitting. And I was really also feeling like I am so far out of my depth at this point that I don't know how to get back to shore. I had no idea. And so that was more than anything. It was really scary. It was daunting. And I didn't have, uh, I I'm sure there are people who are very mature at 22. I wasn't. Right. You know, I just was not. Uh, on what level was it, was it daunting? Like when you're flying around, was it the travel? Was it the pressure of, of having all these people say, oh, you're great? Or what, 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 was the, what was the hang up there? I think the hang up for me was feeling so profoundly fraudulent. Uh, mm. Like I didn't realize I was going to write a book until I'd gone and done it. Right. I never had this sense that, and that happens to me every time I write a book, you know, I'm working on my sixth now and I'm like, ah, I'm never going to get this thing done. Who, whoever told me who, who kind of didn't have my head that I could write a book, you know, like it's never going to really get through to me. I don't think that I can do it yeah. twice, let alone six times. And so that first time everybody was asking me, you know, why did you make this decision creatively? Or why did you decide to write this? And I'm sitting there like blinking like a deer in headlights going, I didn't mean to. You know, and so like there was this horrible collision of, and this, you see this with people at, at now being a professor. Now I see this all the time. It's like kids who have these incredible ideas that they can take just anywhere. And then you say, say, when was the last time you did laundry? And they're like, I've been out of quarters for six months. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. like this, this collision of realities where like, you kind of don't have your feet under you as a human yet at that point. You really don't. Your brain may work fine. But if you can't change your tire, you're still stuck at the side of the road. Yeah, very true. So, yeah, that's, all, that's really what it was, was this sort of the dissonance, I think, between my sense of myself, which was as like a, an overdressed 11-year-old, um, and the reality that I had to go represent my publishing house, you know, in a suit with a, yeah. that I couldn't even begin to afford. You know? <laughs> Did they make you dress up in a suit? No, I think that was costuming for me as much as like, I, as much as anything else. You know, I, uh, what do you, what do you wear to a work thing when you're 22? I don't know. You go to Target and buy the cheapest suit they got, you yeah. know, <laughs> you try to walk in heels without falling over. Were you, had you stopped drinking at this point? No, I had not. And that, that certainly, that escalated my path towards sobriety. I would say, let's put it that way. Um, my, my race for the bottom was, uh, <clears throat> picked up speed as I was running around the world trying to like figure out what I had done or what I was going to do next. Um, so I, I stopped drinking when I was in my late twenties. Uh, and, uh, that was a big, a, really an important step for me in terms of gathering my mental health, eating disorders aside, you know, my eating disorder by then was very much like not a, not a primary issue for me, but my mental health was still really fragile, I think, because, well, I mean, anybody who's drinking a great deal, their mental health is by definition fragile. Right. And because I had a diagnosis of bipolar and that was not clear to me yet what the relationship was between the bipolar disorder and the fact that I was basically pouring gasoline on a fire. You know what I mean? How, how so? Because it, it well, reignited the... With bipolar, as with any mental health disorder, um, any kind of, you know, I mean, you have one organ here, you have your brain which is, you know, and you have, the, you have this body, you've got this one organism. You cannot actually remove your brain, set it down, drink scotch all night, every night for seven years and go, I wonder why I feel so crummy yeah. when I put my brain back in in the morning. I mean, it's just like, it's, we're, not, we're not separate pieces. You know, we're not, we're not discreetly mental health, physical health, professional health, economic health. Those are all bound up in each other, you know? those influences, I mean, there's such a recursive process going on between like, if I'm taking care of my mental health, well, hey, physical health gets better. If I'm taking care of my physical health, well, hey, my mental health improves radically real quick. Yeah. And so because I was so uh, unwilling to believe that my, my drinking and drug use was related, let alone causal in my mental health problems, uh, I kept it up pretty hardcore for a pretty long time. And then I had this incredible, she was a resident. I was in, um, I don't know, I was back in the, I was back in the hospital for one or another thing. And, uh, and this, this very nice resident, I remember coming to basically out of some kind of med induced coma. 
she's snapping her fingers in front of my face. And I'm like, hey, that's rude, lady. Um, <laughs> and she's like, you know what? I just, want to, I just want to be clear on one point. If you keep drinking, you will never, ever be stable. And I remember that so clearly. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? They're not even related. She's like, I'm out. You know, we can't even have this conversation. <laughs> you know, and so like, but that really stuck with me. And I didn't get, I didn't get myself together right then, but that was the beginning of the end of my substance abuse. That was the beginning of the end. <laughs> I was realizing that it wasn't like, you know, the whole story you hear about people self-medicating to deal with their mental health issues. There may be, there is truth to that. You know, there's truth to that. But the fact is that the more I was quote unquote medicating my mental health, the worse my mental health got. Right. Once I stopped medicating my mental health issues, wow, those mental health issues sure cleared up quick. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, I mean, I, interesting. You know, it is interesting. W w did, was it easier to, to sort of slip into that pattern? Because I know it's like a big thing among writers of like, oh, I'm, a, you know, I'm drinking and depressed. <laughs> and this, that just shows how creative I must be because that's what writers right. are. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, cer certainly to me, it was very clear to me that people were very willing to help me believe that, you know, this is the way I've always seen it. People will work with you to kind of, we call it co-signing your bullshit. <laughs> you know, mm. people are like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's totally understandable if you want to just like keep drinking until you're blue in the face. When I got sober, people argued with me and they're like, you don't have the drinking problem. I'm like, I'm sorry, you've been peeling me off the floor for 20 years. You know, yeah. I know you have encountered me acting badly because of substances. And they're like, no, you just do that because you have bipolar. And I was like, well, that's very nice of you to say, but I think it's because I'm a jerk. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, like maybe I actually have more say in this than this sort of passive idea that, well, because I'm a writer or because I'm bipolar or because I'm eccentric or because I have an addictive personality or because I'm short or because it's Thursday, you know, whatever. Right. I can come up with any number of reasons why it's a great idea for me to be a jerk. But at the end of the day, that still makes me a jerk. Well, so like the question becomes, how do I get ahead of this and try and handle these things more effectively? Do you think when you say you're being a jerk, were you being a jerk or uh, just like drunk? Well, I was not a pleasant drunk. Uh, I was not the jolly <laughs> drunk who sat there making jokes and, you know, saying cheers with beer. That was not me. No. But also any addict becomes, I mean, actually there's a line in uh, Wasted, I just thought of where it says, you know, eating disorders have the centripetal force of a black hole. Every addiction does, you know, mm. every addiction if I am not taking care of myself on a day-to-day -day -day basis, who's taking care of me? That puts someone else in a position where they are forced to take care of me. If I decide I'm not going to eat, who's going who's gonna to make that happen? Well, soon somebody else has to step in and make sure I do. If I'm drinking, soon enough, somebody else is going to be like, wow, I walked in front of your car while you were drunk. You know, I mean, all of those things, again, we're, not, we're living in such a complicated web of humans and lives that if I'm not keeping my nose clean, I'm getting that on somebody else, right? So yeah. like that doesn't mean I fault myself for having addictive tendencies and probably genetic predispositions to addictive behavior. Okay, that said, there are ways, you know, I mean, this is the thing. Like I can pretend I can't help something until I know I can. After mm -hmm. that, if I'm still saying, yeah, I know there's a way to stop doing this, I'm just not gonna, that's a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, fair enough. That's, I think that's, that's an important reframing because otherwise it just makes it, it, it makes it seem like you're helpless. Although I, I will say, isn't it, do you feel like that's all at all contradictory um, of what they say in like the first step of the 12 steps where it's like, accept that you are powerless or, or, I mean, do you have any feelings about that? I, I do. I, I, yeah. I think that's a great question. And I think it's really important because people who deal with any form of addiction may well find something useful in those 12 steps. I have uh, in a variety of ways. I've found them super useful. That first step is we admitted we were powerless over blank substance, whatever, right? Um, and you know, in, in, in various and sundry programs, it's a different thing. Uh, for me, the fact is, yeah, once I put a drink in my body, I have a crazy, like I lose my sense of what, what is the next choice that I need to make. 
right? Mm. Suddenly all choices get derailed onto, I need to get drunker. And that's an end game, you know, that you're already toward the end there. Like once you're in it, you can't get out, right? I can't think my way sober once I've got the booze in my body. That said, if I walk over and get a drink right now, I was stone cold sober when I did that. Like, right. So right. what, to what extent? And that's, that's a, that's a conversation I have with people all the time is like, and I don't think I have a hard and fast sense of, um, can I help taking that drink? Well, as long as I'm sober. Yeah. So far I can. You yeah. Know, nobody. And I said this in wasted too. You know, I said, nobody took my plate away. Nobody caused me to become on a, you know, maybe nobody gave me the tool I needed. On the other hand, you know, I hate to cite Prince and I'm in Minneapolis, right? But in this life, you're on your own, buddy. You know, right. and so like, as soon as I realize I am stepping on someone else's life, it is up to me to back up. And if that is hard for me, well, then it is. And I don't mean to be feeling, I don't mean to be unfeeling, but I've spent so much time in psychiatric care listening to people say, well, you'll never be able to fill in the blank. Hmm. And I've not found that ever to be true. I've not found it ever to be true that I will never be able to work or teach or get married or have a family or have friendships. I mean, the idea that the learned helplessness that is ingrained in a lot of mental health care really concerns me because it really is pervasive. It really does tell people you are not powerful enough to work with what you have. What you have is so damaging that you are broken before you've started. And I, I don't buy it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's true. And I also don't think it's very helpful because then people no, go, oh, right. oh, you know, well, I guess if this will never be fixed, why even bother? That's exactly it. Yeah. That's when, when you talk about psychiatric care, how, how old were you when you first uh, realized or were diagnosed that you had bipolar? Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar when I was right after Wasted came out. So I was 23, I think, uh, when I was diagnosed. Okay. And, and is that bipolar one, two, or? Bipolar one. Okay. And so now, like, you know, it's been in remission and, you know, they told that wasn't going to happen either. And so now that it's been in remission for oh, whatever, 13, 14 years, I haven't had, I haven't had a major episode since 2007. Um, then, of course, there's all this revisionist history where everybody I've seen, like psychiatrically for the past 10 years, is like, you probably didn't have it in the first place. I was like, how convenient <laughs> that we can like <laughs> revise what I had, which was clearly, I mean, there was like no question. Nobody was wondering if I had bipolar one. I mean, I was like manic as the day is long. Yeah. But not having been since 2007, they're like, oh, they probably made a mistake. And I was like, well, okay, well, that's cool. But all <laughs> that like, oh, that's how unfortunate. <laughs> that, right, right, right. That's a long time on meds to have not actually had the issue. Um, yeah. but, but the fact is, we don't know, we know, and you are, of all people, fully aware of this, we don't know very much about the brain, for starters. We don't know very much about, and the diagnoses are entirely phenomenological. They're not, we don't know what bipolar is except to say it is these symptoms it looks like this yeah. well when those symptoms change and it looks like something else did the bipolar go away or did the person who had it change the way they dealt with the symptoms and their impetus it's like chicken the egg kind of thing right. we really don't know yet we don't know yeah it, it's it can be kind of frightening how little we know about the brain. I was talking to this neuroscientist who has a a lab where he uh, he treats depression. It's all very experimental. But he was saying, yeah. you know, the the different it's they're treating depression for different people based on like the the structure of their brain. Some people are cured of their depression just by turning on a blue light in their room when they go to sleep. Like that mm. makes. Some people have a certain part of their brain zap with electricity. Some people need SSRIs. Like it's, you know, it must be very, uh, I mean, it, that, that's a confusing state of mind for anybody to just be like, oh, oh yeah. my God, I, I, you know, this brain that we think we have control over could really slip away at any moment. Any moment. And I think that, honestly, I think that is exactly, you just pinpointed why I think people are afraid of mental illness is because they realize at some level, I think we all realize that madness is not somebody else. Right. You know, that's, that's embedded in all of us as human beings. Um, 
um, <clears throat> any symptom of a mental health disorder is just a human trait amplified in a really big way. Um, whether it's a mood disorder or a thought disorder, and those aren't even necessarily discrete anymore. We used to call those like, you know, categorically different things. Well, then they've changed that. So like the way I heard it best put was by um, the director of the Lieber Brain Institute at Johns Hopkins is a really fascinating man, uh, Daniel Weinberger. And he said to me once about meds, and this was before I really had started doing research on medication. I was like, okay, so what is this? Like I gave him my list. I was, I was working on an article, so it wasn't really about it wasn't at all about me. And I said, what about these three meds? He goes, okay, so basically what those are doing, and he says this with a totally straight face, he goes, those, you take them, what we're doing there is carpet bombing your brain and hoping something hits. Wow. And I was like, that's a sad moment for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really unhappy that you just put it that way, Dr. Yeah. Weber. <laughs> you know? But you know, he did, and he's like, the thing is we aren't precise those medications, the techniques, the neuroscientists you're talking about, you know, it's amazing if they've gotten to where they can say, this part of the brain requires a blue light. Um, if he's got, if he's got a lot of people uh, who can back him up on that, that's amazing because that we don't have the precision to do that yet to the best of my knowing. Well, well he, he, he's not, he's not saying that you can take a scan of the brain and say, okay, this is what's going to work for this person. Exactly. Okay. But they, they're, they're mapping out. They say, okay, this person, we're trying this set of treatments on this person and right. seeing how their brain responds. And okay, it looks like the blue light works for this person based on their own self-reported symptoms, based on brain scans, et cetera. And right. the fact that I, I just thought that was interesting because of the fact that, I mean, some people, it, it's like everybody who goes into treatment for depression tends to yeah. get treated one way, which is with yes. SSRIs. Which mostly don't work. I mean, that's the thing is like, we try not to talk about it, but SSRIs are so, their effectiveness rate is so low for the majority of takers that like, we don't, I mean, and the side effects are very, very high. I'm not opposed to SSRIs at all because I know people for whom they've worked brilliantly. Right. I just know more for whom they have not. And so like, the thing is the idea that we can one size fits all treat the brain is insane to me. I mean, it's just like, it's a brain. Like the, the biggest thing that has made me laugh in the last, you know, 10 years about the way neuroscience is talking about mental health is that people get so mad about those self reports. They're like, that's not scientific. I'm like, did you have a better way of accessing what's happening in my brain besides my self report? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like did you have a way of getting in there and arguing with me about me. <laughs> Because I don't think you do. And so like, but at the same time, they, they use all these wonderful words and you've heard of the about fuzzy and subjective and like, you know, what is this non-scientific stuff? And like, yes, great. But you, you are not going to find a way to tell me what is wrong with my brain without figuring out what is wrong with my life. Nor mm. are you going to figure out how I'm going to recover if you don't figure out what I'm good at. And so that's like... Neuro is a huge and incredible and fascinating and fruitful vein of inquiry. But until we get the sense that neuro in and of itself will not get us the answers to our existential questions, and those are what really plague us, you know? So we've got to yeah. keep all these pieces in balance somehow. Yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating because on the one hand, I can see why a scientist would say, okay, this person who is, say, schizophrenic and is reporting mm -hmm. their symptoms, it's, mm -hmm. it feels unreliable because this person is having some kind of psychotic break. They're literally mm -hmm. breaking with reality. So mm -hmm. on that level, it's, I, I can see why, even though I agree with you, that it's, you have, the only way you can judge someone's consciousness is based on their own described experience of it right um yeah. but man yeah it's it, w there's a long way to go before we oh, have yeah. any clear understanding or can even say that we have a scientific underpinning of how the brain works i mean absolutely absolutely i mean it is one of the most fascinating like it's like undiscovered territory and in that sense it is so exciting but at the same time you know, I'm, I'm living in the house, you know, upstairs is my buddy who has schizophrenia. And it never occurs to me to ask her, are you right about yourself? <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm pretty sure she is, you know. Right, right, right. Sure the fact that 
she and I get up every day. We go to our jobs. We talk. We have walks. We feed the dogs. We do our friendship and we have our lives. Like at no point does it occur to me to be like, I'm not sure if she's right today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if she's having symptoms, she'll be like, yeah, I'm having symptoms. I'm going to go lie down. Like that's her self-report is to take right. care of herself. And so like the fact that, you know, and, and it always is a guy in a suit, Duncan, you know, it's always a guy in a suit, you know, it's yes. not always a guy, but they're always in a suit. Right. So you walk in and you're like, this is how I'm feeling. And they basically say, mm, uh, no. Yeah. And then you just sort of put your head in your hands and you're like, okay, you tell me how I'm feeling. You tell me what is wrong with me and you tell me what I have. And, uh, and then I'm going to go home and like kick the wall. Yeah. It's just, there's such a disconnect between recognizing that we won't understand neuro until we talk to people who have neurodiverse experiences. We won't understand it. No, fair like enough. You stare at my brain until you're blue in the face. And yeah. it won't tell you why I was manic every 25 minutes until I was 35. And then when I hit menopause, I was fine. Like, can I, can I ask you something? Out. Yeah. Um, I can wrap my mind around depression. I can't yeah. wrap my mind around mania. Like, mm -hmm. what, what is that experience like? I know it's, that's a huge open-ended question. So. No, it's actually a really good one because I think people do – really wonder about that. The best way I heard that explained, in fact, one of the first times I really got a sense of what was going on physiologically in my brain during mania was when I was talking to the guys over at U of M uh, or at Ann Arbor, right? So a couple of the dudes over there have really brilliant ways of talking um, to laypersons about mania. And the way that um, this one guy described, he's got a little notepad he's describing to me. He's, he basically says mania is a disorder of activation, right? So the cells in the brain are super, super responsive, reactive, in some cases, hyper-reactive to uh, stimulus when you're in a manic state. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we all, we all have our range of emotion and responsiveness and all of those things. But when you are in a state of mania, the cells themselves, and this translates almost literally, almost like it's a metaphor, the cells are so reactive that you can't stop them bouncing around off each other. And so that's what thought becomes like when you're manic, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going along, you know, one day you're a little more energetic than the next. And then the next day you're a little more energetic and you get lots of ideas. And that's hypomania. That early stage is like you're just feeling incredibly energized uh you got a lot of ideas you've got you can get stuff done you're effective you know and so everything's going great until it goes a little too far and your great ideas you know i've i've, I've talked to guys who are like you know and then one day i woke up and i had this great idea i'm gonna buy a sports team and you're like whoa 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 that's a leap <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're gonna what he goes yeah so i embezzled the company's funds and bought a sports team i'm like that is mania Right, wow. like so, you just this incredible sharp left turn from energetic, lots of ideas to you're in flight of ideas. You're in, you have a lack of sense of what proportion is, and so like things that aren't reasonable at all start to seem really reasonable. Like you know, I really need the sports team really, really badly, <clears throat> so I'm going to embuzzle the funds. Yeah. Like I can't wrap my head around that either. And yet, I've also seen myself do some really fascinating, illogical things that now I'm like, what were you thinking? Well, I wasn't. My body and my brain were really, really, um, I remember the feeling of mania, which hasn't, I haven't actually been manic since 2007. So I remember the feeling of it as being like having the fast forward button on me pushed. And like, there was no way to get someone to turn it off. Yeah. So, yeah. W was that... Favorite. So is that unpleasant? I mean, that might seem like a stupid question, but it, it... No, it's not a stupid question at all. It's a very good question. At first, it's not unpleasant. You know, the most common episode uh, is not in with bipolar, right? So, you know, the old phrase manic depression was just as effective, probably more accurate. Um, because in the majority of the time with, with a manic depressive case that you're dealing with like actual balance between manic and depression, um, between mania and depression, you're not strictly one or the other. The most common episode is actually a mixed episode. So like mm -hmm. you've got the dark thoughts that are characteristic of depression. You've got the depression, really. You know, you've got the, 
the anxiety, the, the frustration, the irritability, some of the anger, some of the, just like the real darkness of spirit that comes with depression. And you feel like your skin's on fire and you've got way too much energy and you can't sleep. And so not only are you dealing with dark thoughts, you're dealing with them 24 hours a day. And so like with depression, at least you can knock yourself out. You can go lie down and sleep for a couple of days, right? right. The mania, you cannot turn off your mind. And at that point, whether it's a mixed episode or just an extremely acute mania, that's not fun. That's not fun at all. It's painful. In a mixed episode, are, is your mood uh, labile? Is it, is it fluctuating based on external events or is it just purely independent of whatever's happening in your life? I would say there is probably not a single mental health symptom that is totally independent of what's happening in your sure. life. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So much of that is we're learning, you know, I mean, we're learning more and more about how much stress influences mental health disorder, how much sleep influences mental health disorder, a lack of exercise creates problems, you know, all this stuff that we used to be like, well, that's not very interesting or complicated. Well, it's the fact though, right? Um, and so when when you're dealing with when you're dealing with a mixed episode, it's not really, it doesn't feel like mood, happy, sad. It feels like constant reactivity. It's like you're like, uh, I've used the word like 80 billion times here. It's hard to no, explain no, you're because good. <laughs> the reactivity is really the most prevailing feeling that I can remember from it is the fact that kind of didn't matter. Yes, externally, it could be a beautiful day. And then suddenly I'm sobbing because I don't know, the flowers were beautiful or whatever. So the reactivity is more acute than the mm. mood itself. That's what, yeah, that's what I noticed the most. The reactivity as in the shifting of mood? Yes. Or the fact that very little could prompt a flight of emotion, right? So like, literally, I've stared out the window and looked at flowers and been sobbing because they were so beautiful. And that was sad somehow. But actually, you know, all the time in our lives, this is true, whether you have mental health disorder or not, we're always looking for language to like explain our experience, right? To give ourselves a narrative, to make it all piece together and have cause and effect. And so we construct this plot in our life of, oh, I am feeling this way because... With mental health disorder, whether it's depression or bipolar, sometimes you're feeling that way because you've had too much sunshine, you know? Right. And so there's no sort of like philosophical causality to it. Sometimes it's just, I've only had five hours of sleep in the last two weeks and now I'm bananas, you right. know? So that's the thing. So it's like, uh, we'd love for there to be some profound and deep reason. And that's, and sometimes there is, but a lot of times it's just, our bodies are exhausted and our brains are part of our bodies. Right, yeah. Or it's like, oh, I'm feeling anxious right now. It's like, oh, wait, I haven't eaten in six hours. Or, you know, oh, exactly. Exactly. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I, I don't know if you're a fan of, of Kanye West at all, um, but he's a, a prominent, he's, I'm, I'm a fan of the guy, and he's, he's a prominent yeah. musician, and he has yeah. bipolar, and he's right now, in uh or i i think he's doing better now but he he has these episodes in public and i wanted to ask you because you you were in a much different situation you were i mean you had a, a successful book but you were like a regular person who if yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you know you did something in the context of mania there were consequences afterwards like you were not right. a billionaire not a celebrity yeah. who's surrounded by yes men like, I know, right? Do you think, I mean, can you imagine yourself in like that kind of situation? Do you think that it would have been way harder to get better? I do. I do. Really good question. I think, you know, this about, I don't know, right when the bipolar diagnosis started getting super overused, I think. People Magazine called me one day, like, and they called me, they're like, hi, it's People Magazine. I'm like, well, hi, how did you, anyway. Yeah. And they're like, do you think Britney Spears has bipolar? She shaved her head. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the direct connection. <laughs> a star shaving sure. her head and a star needing to be like psychiatrically hospitalized. And I said to them, with all due respect, I don't know Britney Spears and I'm not a psychiatrist, nor do I have any reason to believe that I would have anything to say about Britney Spears. I mean, this is not like 
the first time a star has behaved erratically. Right, right, so, right, right. So the impulse to like, Kanye is different insofar as he has been open about the fact that he does have a diagnosis. <clears throat> and yes, so having a lot of, it's, I don't even think it's the money, I think it's the visibility that would be hard with that, is that you can just like, when you are a public figure, when you are, oh, what do they call them, a thought influencer or an influencer of something or another, um, when you're out in the public eye all the time, that's as much your life as your life. You know what I mean? Like yeah. at home, you know, your kids, your dog, you're, you know, washing the car on a Saturday. That's some of our lives. But people who deal in the public eye constantly are both vulnerable and dangerous in some ways, you know, because nobody, as you say, nobody will stop them. Nobody will step up and go, actually, you're probably off the rails now, Mr. President. Right. Um, and so, like, nobody will step up and say, probably we need to s sit down for a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. Take a nap, drink some juice, whatever. <laughs> you know, and so I think it would have been very, very difficult. Because, like, how, how hard is it for any one of us to keep a sense of proportion when we're living public lives all the time anyway? let alone when you're Kanye West. Yeah. That's a whole nother order. And that's like an exponential difference of degree, not in kind, but in degree of public life. And, and also all of your, you know, big dreams and ideas have in many ways been rewarded and come true. Right. So yep. it, when someone steps in and says, no, you need help. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm right. I'm Kanye West. Like, right, you need exactly. help. <laughs> that's, that's like, what are you talking about? Who needs help when they're Kanye West? Yeah. And you know, that's a that's a that's a risk for anybody. I think that's part of the hubris of being human, but also when you are dealing with something that actually does create a departure from the lived world that everybody else is sort of participating in much of the time, uh, nobody can stop you, and yeah. uh, all of us need that bumper. We all need an, you know, I think Prince actually, to bring, to bring a Prince, Prince used to say, you need one friend who's not on your payroll. And in that sense, that's the person who, who is required. We have that friend in our life who can say, no, this is too far. Or just don't, you yeah. know, just knock it off. And uh, if we don't have that in our lives, we all mess up. And when, when we're a public figure, you know, when you're a public figure, that it's, it's just messing up in the same way on a grand and expensive scale. For, for you, when you would recover from a manic episode and you look mm -hmm. back and what, what it all happened, like, was that in some ways almost like more difficult to be like, oh my God, I can't believe I did all that shit. Yes. Uh, I think once I got... Once I got away from booze, I, I, I stopped waking up with that feeling of remorse and oh no. I started being like, how did I acquire 17 of the same purse? You know, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, why have I invested in a great many coach hats that I don't even like because I don't like wearing hats? You know, whatever it was, like I'd get into a, a jag. You know, eBay came out at about the same time as my, as my bipolar peaked. Wowza. Uh, that was an intriguing intersection of things. And so I learned pretty quick to do things like don't keep credit cards in your purse. Don't keep credit cards. You know, don't, don't go shopping when you're feeling, when you have the thought to yourself, you know what I want to do? I want to buy something. Like who has that thought anyway? Like what for? To me, those are like the signals. And this is really where it gets down to like the psychosocial aspects of recovery. Yes, all those medical interventions may be helpful, but at the end of the day, the most helpful thing I can do is not drink, sleep, eat healthy, take a lot of walks, do my yoga, meditate, and not keep credit cards on myself. That, uh, I mean, we, we could almost wrap it up there. I think that's a great way to, to end it. But is, is there anything before we go um, that, that you want to... Uh, you want to plug or you want to get in that you, you haven't been able to get out? Yeah, I think, you know, just to, just to kind of circle back to that, that thing I just said, you know, we, we have, as people who deal with mental health care, whether as providers or as researchers or as scientists or as physicians, whatever, or as clients, we are acculturated to believing that God knows best and doctor knows best and father knows best to the, to the extent that we can be proactive in our lives. We will be 
more successful. To the every every step I take to take care of my own mental health, it's me nine you know nine times as far in my mental health as taking the drug. This doctor doesn't know if it's going to work or not. Maybe it will. That'll be helpful. That's awesome. But if I'm not also doing all these pieces and deciding where do I come in and where does my will and my choices come in, I won't get better. And so like for the people who listen, who, who are really like, how do I get better? I feel helpless. This is a scary diagnosis. This is a scary experience, whatever it is. Yes. And the world is scary and life is hard and all those things. And we still have choices and we need to make them. So I just empower yourselves. I think that's really all I want people to be able to hear is that they can do a lot more than, than they are being told they can do. I think that's an amazing message. And, and Maria, thank you very much for talking to me. Cause I mean, Absolutely. I, uh, very much enjoy this and, um, Likewise. A- a- anytime you want to come back on your, you got an open invite. So wonderful. good to hear. Thank you so much for doing this show, Duncan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Alrighty. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you to Maria Hornbacher and thanks for listening to Dunk Tank. I'm Duncan Gammy. See you next time.